All righty, we're going to get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Distinguished Speaker Series. I am Nancy Walters. I'm the Executive Director of the La Jolla Community Center. And joining us today is Dr. Erica Oberg. She is an integrative and natural medicine physician, and she's going to be talking to us about building a better brain. I'll tell you a little bit more about her in just a bit. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit more about the La Jolla Community Center. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. For those of you returning, welcome back. Thank you so much for being here today. If you don't know much about the La Jolla Community Center, please visit our website. That's where you'll be able to see all of our great programs and services that we offer daily here at the Community Center. We have everything from daily classes like Zumba, yoga, and art classes and language, as well as special series and events like today's Distinguished Speaker Series. We also have wonderful concert series and musical events coming up in the next few months. So please check out our website to learn more. It's www www.ljcommunitycenter.org. And a little bit before we um, introduce Dr. Oberg, if you have questions at the end of the presentation, please use the Q&A function on your screen. You can also use the chat to um, make any comments for me directly or for um, anyone, any of the panelists, but I will be moderating those. So please use Q&A or chat and I'll be, I will be reading those at the end of the presentation. So thank you all for joining us again and a little bit about Dr. Erica Oberg. Dr. Oberg has practiced integrative and natural medicine for nearly 20 years. She has held leadership positions in medical schools, NIH research, public health and clinical practice. Her approach to health and medicine combines the rigors of science with the wisdom of nature and our bodies. She is passionate about helping people experience health as a state of vibrancy and vitality. As such, her clinical practice focuses on preventing, reversing, and taming chronic disease, neuroregeneration, and anti-aging. Dr. Oberg specializes in nutrition and lifestyle, IV micronutrient therapy, and identifying the underlying causes of disease using advanced testing. She is a creator of a 28-day Better Brain program that can be followed at home to jumpstart a brain-healthy lifestyle. Please help me welcome Dr. Erica Oberg. Hi, thanks so much, Nancy. It's a pleasure to be here. I always love talking to uh, our local community here in La Jolla. It's always such just a great uh, audience and super participatory. So um, I will leave some time at the end for, um, for questions here. So let me see if I can get the screen sharing um, sorted out here and then get us switched over into there. I think that should be working. All right, so today we're going to be talking about brain health and how we can uh, keep our brains healthy and active and working for us and uh, how we can get some function back if maybe we're not feeling quite at the top of our game anymore. So Nancy gave a lovely introduction here, uh, but here's my team, including a sweet Sitta, my dog, my therapy dog that works in our office here. And um, I've been doing this for about 20 years, practicing natural medicine, and uh, I love it. It's just such a wonderful, um, I just get the joy of seeing people get better and improve. And even, you know, even when things are rough and tough and people aren't at the top of their game, I still love the human connection and uh, helping people find wellness with whatever their physical capacity is at the moment. So let's start with a little bit of history here. Alzheimer's disease, right? This is what we're all terrified about. And Alzheimer's disease was uh, named after uh, the physician Alo um, Alois Alzheimer, who was the first to do uh, autopsies on um, a person who had intellectual deterioration, as they called it, more than 100 years ago. And he saw, he was the first to describe and really see that characteristic pattern of changes in the tissue where we're seeing um, plaques and tangles and fibers. And so it was based on those physical changes um, that the disease was was um, diagnosed. And so what's really going on in there, right? Why did he see those anatomy changes in the actual brain tissue? Well, it's a process that happens slowly over many, many years of gunk accumulating essentially in the brain. And so we can end up with proteins that misfold and those can cause neurofibrillary tangles and tau tangles. We can get proteins that make plaques not, uh, not dissimilar to the stuff in our cardiovascular system. 
one very important uh, aspect of um, brain health is making sure that it is draining and detoxing properly. We have a whole system called the glymphatic drainage system, which is similar to our lymph system that's um, active, especially overnight. And that's important to clear out the trash and keep um, your brain functioning well. We can have vascular issues that uh, can add to the problem, things such as TIAs and strokes and um, cerebrovascular uh, disease where we have um, cardiovascular plaques in the, in the blood vessels to the brain and we're not getting enough oxygen up there. Um, and then we've got lifestyle factors um, and alcohol abuse and stress probably being the top two that really impact the brain. But we'll talk about a bunch of these over um, the course of the day here. So let's start off with a little self-diagnosis and some humor here, right? So what is normal cognitive function? So people come in all the time worried about this. You know, I lost my keys. I must be losing my mind. Do I have dementia? Well, here's our scientific study. If you lost your keys, a quarter of people prayed and found their keys. A quarter prayed and didn't find their keys. A quarter didn't pray, but they found their keys. And a quarter didn't pray and didn't find their keys. Funny way of saying, uh, losing your keys is not a sign of losing cognitive function. But let's talk about some things that maybe we should be paying attention to, some things that might be possible signs. And certainly if many of these are present, you know, it might um, be a sign that you wanna come talk to uh, your doctor or a doctor like me about these types of things. So some of the possible signs might be memory loss that disrupts your daily life, not just misplacing your keys, but um, truly disrupting your life, not being able to get to appointments, not being able to remember what you're doing. Um, challenges in planning and problem solving. Uh, this is often an early one. You might see this in, um, you know, older adults in your in your lives, um, where you know doing the bookkeeping isn't possible anymore. Planning ahead and scheduling vacations, or things like that, become overwhelming. They just you can't really do that type of complex planning anymore. We might see uh, difficulty with familiar tasks, things that uh, people have been doing successfully for years. Um, for example, my grandmother was a um, avid knitter in her day and she did very, very complex, elaborate um, sweaters and patterns. And as she developed Alzheimer's um, in her later years, she wasn't able to knit anymore, even though she had, you know, 50 years of, of muscle memory on how to knit. She wasn't be able to do that anymore. We see a confusion with time and place. We have uh, trouble understanding uh, visual images or spatial relationships. Uh, I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes when we look at some of the testing. Um, we can have problems following conversations or joining in conversations. And this is an important one to also um, not confuse with hearing loss, because often um, having a difficult time and that kind of social withdrawal sometimes has nothing to do with um, cognition and everything to do with hearing aids that aren't working or simply not wearing the hearing aids and not being able to participate um, socially because of that. So make sure the, uh, the hearing aid uh, problem is fixed before we jump to uh, more serious assessments. Um, so we do have, the, you know, a sign can be misplacing stuff, but usually if you misplace stuff, right, you can go through that thought process of retracing your steps. And when we lose that ability, that's a little bit more worrisome. Uh, sometimes we see uh, changes in judgment or filtering. Um, personalities might change. Somebody who is super sweet and um, very easygoing their whole life might become very ornery or angry. Um, and of course, that, that social uh, withdrawal can happen. So uh, in my practice, we use a couple different tools to uh, to quantify, and I'm, I'm a big fan of getting accurate assessments and quantifying where people are so that we can track progress, right? And you can see if you're improving or uh, how rapidly things are declining or uh, just staying steady, which sometimes we're super happy with. Many of you might be familiar with the, uh, the paper test on the right there, the MOCA, that's a common one. I also use an online one from Cambridge Brain Sciences um, that's like a computer test and it's much more precise. But I'll show you a little example here of what we were just talking about. Um, 
with the, uh, there's a little delay on the clicks here, um, on the spatial relationships, right? So here we have um, this is a common test, the draw the, draw the square test um, and draw the clock test. Let me see if we can see the cursor. So you have to trace this little path, but here's drawing the square and um, drawing a clock that says that it's 10 past 11. And this was done in uh, September. And after a month of working with uh, this particular gentleman in his, uh, I think, late 70s, maybe early 80s, uh, we did a bunch of IV vitamin therapy and um, some other things, cleaned up his uh, lifestyle, put him on some supplements, and he's doing a better job. He's drawing the clock. His, his cognitive function has improved. And that was a pretty fast one. That's only a little over a month. Usually it doesn't happen quite that fast, but improvements can happen. So let's talk a little bit about what's kind of underlying all of this, what the, uh, what the um, mechanisms are that might be going on that lead to all of the, that garbage in the brain that I was talking about. Well, a term that we often use when we're talking about this is inflammaging, right? So this is the inflammatory process that makes us age. And there's a bunch of things that contribute to inflammation. It can be toxins in our environment, in our diet, um, the microbiome, we are becoming more and more um, savvy about the importance of that, and especially oral health. You know, when we have really poor oral health and lots of bacteria in the mouth, it is really just such a short little trip for it to get into the, uh, the bloodstream and into the brain. And so there is a big connection between um, chronic gingivitis and oral health problems and, uh, and, cognitive, and cognitive decline. Nutrient deficiencies are a huge issue and they're often underappreciated. Sometimes it's because we're not uh, cooking quite as diversely for ourselves anymore. There's lots of issues with absorbing nutrition um, as we get older and stomach acid and things like that don't function quite so well. Um, we can have all of those problems associated with our metabolism, you know, overweight, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, all of those things play a big role. Um, our mitochondria, and I'll talk about those a little bit more in a minute. And of course, genetics do play a role, um, of course, but, uh, but that is certainly not the whole picture. So at a cellular level, this is kind of what's happening um, as we age. We have the, what we call cellular senescence, cells that age. So in a, uh, in a healthy young situation, right, we've got a little snapshot of cells here and they're all functioning and doing their job and, you know, taking up nutrients and making energy and um, keeping your immune system happy, et cetera. But as we get old in, in the, the negative sense of um, aging, we start to accumulate these senescent cells. And I think about these as like the couch potatoes of cells, right? They're, they're here, they're taking up space, they're taking up nutrients, um, they're taking up energy, but they're not functioning very well anymore. They aren't, uh, they aren't repairing their DNA, they're getting sloppy, they're not cleaning up the trash. They're literally taking up space and energy and and causing an unhealthy environment for the surrounding cells. So one of our strategies in um, reversing cognitive decline and slowing the aging process is to retrain the body to clean up these cells and get rid of these, uh, these wasteful couch potato senescent cells. And, uh, and that's through a process that we call autophagy, right? In a, in a healthy young body, the cleanup process is active and um, cells that aren't functioning like that are um, set on a self-destroy uh, program so that they get out of the way and get rid of, but that gets disrupted and we start accumulating them. So resetting that autophagy is a key strategy here. So I think it's important to uh, just put this in perspective. You know, we're not just talking about an, an elderly population and Alzheimer's and late onset dementia and things like that. Cognitive problems can affect everybody at every age. Young people are often in just as, as challenging of a state because of overwhelm and uh, the environmental exposures that we've accumulated over our lifetimes. Um, especially as we, you know, the younger population has been exposed to all of these environmental uh, issues since birth. 
Whereas people in their 80s and 90s did have a couple decades of pretty clean living before the planet uh, got to be the state that it's in right now. So for younger people, stress is a huge issue. Um, just that overwhelm, too many demands, uh, multitasking, uh, no time for a healthy diet um, or getting enough exercises, drinking too much. Um, and the blue light on devices is not to be underappreciated. There's a growing body of research that shows that uh, the light emitting from our devices is very disruptive to our brain function and our ability to uh, focus and sleep and many other things. So um, I'm going to share a little bit about uh, the 28 day program that I've created as we kind of go through here, um, because I wanted a way to really help people supercharge their brain power. And I wanted something that um, that would be accessible for more than just the people who live here in La Jolla or in California and work with me on telehealth. You know, there's only so many people that I can um, reach and work with on a one on one basis. So over uh, last summer, I worked with a um, team of technology experts to take some of my lifestyle recommendations and turn it into an app and a program that people can follow themselves to really jumpstart their brain health. So it's pretty exciting. It's been really, it was a fun development process for me to uh, go through putting that plan together in a way that people um, could follow. And it was really with the help of the uh, you know, the tech experts that um, helped me kind of pull this into something doable. So it includes, um, you know, menus and diets, and then those got turned into shopping lists to make it super easy and supplement recommendations and breathing and exercise. All sorts of great things are in there. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that throughout it, but in this lecture, I also want to give you some concrete things that you can learn in just this hour here that I have with you to apply to, um, to your own brain health. So let's talk about diet. Everybody's always um, seeking tips and strategies on how we can optimize uh, what we eat to improve our health and our, uh, our well-being. And there's a million things that we can do. So let's hone in on a couple of the ones that have the strongest evidence base for, um, for brain health. So the first thing I want to share with you is a caloric restriction and cognition. So um, this is extremely well researched. There's over 17,000 um, research studies in the uh, PubMed database about the benefits of ca caloric restriction on brain health and cognition. And, um, and there's a lot of different ways of doing it. So we'll kind of sort through some of those different ways of doing um, reducing calories to get these benefits. The, uh, some of you might be familiar with uh, the Blue Zones research. So uh, it's a book that details uh, seven places around the world where populations on average live into their 80s and 90s and uh, live to those older ages um, happily and healthfully. And one of those areas is Okinawa, Japan. And, uh, and they have a, you know, their cheers or their toast uh, saying there is uh, harahachibu. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but something roughly around that. And it translates to, you know, approximately, may you be satisfied at 80%. And so this, uh, this concept really comes into how they eat, how they live, but uh, from a dietary standpoint, standpoint, it really is about, you know, stopping at about 80% full, right? Not overfilling ourselves, not overdoing it, just kind of stopping at a little bit less. Um, of course, what they eat is also very healthy, lots of anti-inflammatory foods um, and all of those great Asian foods like seaweed and uh, miso and um, tofu and, you know, those fermented foods are all great things for the body. But this concept of being satisfied at 80%, um, I think, is a nice a rule of thumb for um, putting caloric restriction into, into your daily diet plan. So... Most of our calories actually come from snacking, right? And this is a place where we can also make some personal changes to, uh, to get that overall caloric intake down. And so um, Americans on average eat five snacks and meals a day, which is up almost 30% from the 70s. 
right? And portion size has gone up um, as well. So we're 12% uh, up on our portion size and almost 30% up on the um, number of times we're eating a day. And it's because the food is just always there, right? If you're in a office space, chances are there's snacks out in the break room. If you're in your home, you probably leave some snacks out on the counter rather than putting everything away. Um, you might have it in your mind that you need to eat more frequently to keep your blood sugar up. And while that can be true for, for some people, in general, we're just eating too much and eating too frequently. So why am I so passionate about caloric restriction? Well, it turns out that when we're, um, when we're a little bit sparse on our calories, and I'm not talking starvation here, we're talking like, you know, 20% reduction, you know, being happy at 80% of what you're normally doing. Uh, when you're when you're in that mild state of um, of caloric deficit, your body has to get really efficient and thrifty, right? It has to be, uh, it has to, your metabolism has to get really um, just smarter, right? And we have to clear out those old cells that are just sitting around like couch potatoes. And a big way that we do that is through activating this CERT1 pathway. For those of you with uh, science backgrounds, you probably will have fun looking into that and learning all about it. But for those of you that aren't scientists, just know that your CERT1 pathway is what's going to really clean up those cells and get your mitochondria, the, the powerhouses inside your cells where we make energy, it's going to get those mitochondria functioning really efficiently. They need to, they learn how to make uh, energy with very few resources. And so when they do have resources, like food, um, then they function really efficiently and we get lots of lots of vitality and energy. Um, and interestingly, a supplement that maybe some of you are taking, resveratrol, also activates this pathway. And resveratrol is also the key antioxidant in wine. So some of the benefits of caloric restriction, well, we've been talking about uh, how it's going to help preserve your, your brain health, but it does a bunch of other things too. It's really going to help prevent osteoporosis. It's going to help prevent sarcopenia or muscle loss. Uh, it's going to protect your colon and reduce your risk for colorectal cancer. Um, we see a lower incidence and lower progression of cancer. Um, in fact, there's been a number of studies that are that have looked at fasting um, like the night before a chemotherapy treatment and people respond much better to uh, to their um, chemotherapy regimens when they get those treatments in a slightly fasted state. Um, diabetes is impacted, cardiovascular disease, um, it reduces the inflammation in the joints and thus protects against arthritis. So there's a lot of benefits here. All right, so, so how might you actually incorporate this into your life? Well, there's a lot of ways that you can implement caloric restriction. And uh, some of you might be familiar with some of these, you know, it's a common religious practice, right? If you think about, for example, Ramadan, you know, where for that entire uh, month or six week period, uh, they don't eat during the day at all and all, all calories are consumed after dark. So that's one way of fasting. Um, you can also, the time restricted eating um, and those fasting strategies I think are really good. We hear, we're hearing a lot about this um, in sort of the popular nutrition media these days, intermittent fasting. Um, so for example, you uh, doing this overnight is a nice easy way. So you might, um, you know, make sure you stop eating after 6 p.m. and you don't have your next meal until after 9 a.m. the next day. And that gives you a nice window. Um, there's other fasting patterns that people can follow uh, and that have been well researched of doing alternative day fastings or taking one or two days a week as a fasting pattern. Um, and anytime they, pe these studies include fasting, of course, this does not include uh, restricting water, right? You don't want to get dehydrated. We're just talking about calories. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that have been studied and uh, examined. So when we do uh, do those longer fasts or more restriction, um, this gives you a sense of these graphs are showing us the time 
um, zero, 12 hours, 24 hours, and where the body is pulling energy from. So in this first one, you see that, um, you know, your carbs really only last, the carbohydrate um, reserves in your body really last about 24 hours. And then we have to switch over to other things in that longer fasted state, like, um, like the fat, which is really what a lot of people are um, carrying around a little bit excess. And similarly in this, this is a little bit more technical, but it shows you basically where the energy comes from. So this yellowish line that's going up. So when we don't have food coming in, then the body starts making energy from its own stores, uh, that glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis process. And those are great because that's coming from uh, burning your reserves of uh, fat largely. So as I said, you know, kind of the easier ways to do these are to uh, skip breakfast or skip dinner um, and really reduce your eating window to a, uh, a smaller number of hours and steering it towards those lower carbohydrate patterns. Um, I sometimes call this keto-ish or paleo-ish if you're familiar with those terms, which are largely um, just low carbohydrate diets. And we'll look at uh, what those look like in a little bit more detail. So I mentioned in that previous slide that, um, that the pathway that we're seeking to activate is that CERT1 pathway to make our genetics very thrifty. Um, so there are foods uh, that we call sirtuins that activate that pathway. I mentioned wine being one of them, but it's a tricky thing with brains, right? Because we also want to um, not over consume alcohol because that's one of the most dangerous things for our brains. So we really want to emphasize these other foods, berries, green tea, um, rocket is arugula, kale, chili peppers are great, dark chocolate is great, a um, number of other foods here. And you'll have these uh, slides available to you so that you can write these down and make your own uh, grocery shopping lists later. So let's talk about alcohol just a little bit more. Oop. Um, as I mentioned, uh, resveratrol is a, uh, is, a, is a healthy polyphenol, but we really have to watch this in moderation, right? And so anywhere above um, a couple drinks a day, um, this graph is a scientific graph, but I think, you know, probably that sweet spot is more like at two glasses rather than that two to four that we're seeing on this graph. Um, there is no, other than the, the presence of the resveratrol, um, alcohol is known to be definitely neurotoxic and, um, and has a negative impact on the brains, especially when people uh, start drinking early in their lives um, or drink heavily or drink regularly. So a good question to ask yourselves or, uh, or if your doctor isn't asking, asking you is how long has it been since you've taken a break from alcohol? And if that's a hard question to answer, then it's probably time to take a break from alcohol. And, uh, and see how you do, see how your brain feels and if you feel clarity and improvement and physical health. And most people feel quite a bit better when they take a break from alcohol if they're regular drinkers. And it just kind of helps you reset your relationship with the stuff. So, um, so let's look at some other nutrients that are key for protecting our brain. So this is a study um, by my uh, friend, Gene Bauman. And he looked at a cohort of um, many people, uh, older people who were being tracked for the development of dementia and Alzheimer's and such. And he analyzed what, uh, what nutrients protected them and what nutrients sped it up. So the nutrients that, uh, that protected people from developing dementia or Alzheimer's were, was a diet plan that was highly nutrient dense and the shorthand to find out if your diet is nutrient dense is how colorful is it, right? Most of the vitamins and the good stuff in our diet are in the colors of fruits and vegetables. So Cheetos do not count, even though they're highly colorful. We're talking about uh, true uh, naturally occurring colors here. Um, these, the most protective pattern was a mostly plant-based pattern, but it did include healthy um, fish, especially the cold water fatty fish like salmon and halibut. 
um, but largely plant-based. And the diets were very high in vitamins B, C, D, and E. So not to say the other vitamins aren't important, but those are the ones that are most important for brain health. And the other thing that's probably most important for brain health is making sure we're not in that state of hyperglycemia of too much, um, too much fuel. It actually goes along hand in hand with a sort of a caloric restriction strategy, but we don't want to be, um, we don't want our blood sugar levels to be too high. In fact, we want them to be as low as possible without causing uh, crashes or hypoglycemia. So when we eat um, carbs, like let's say, you know, white rice or um, a big sandwich or cookies or, um, you know, pastries, anything like that that's going to have a lot of carbohydrate or sugar in it, our blood sugar is going to go up and immediately after that our insulin has to go up um, unless you have diabetes and you're not producing insulin, in which case you might be injecting insulin. And the insulin is necessary to get that sugar out of your blood and into your brain and your muscles. Well, often after we've eaten, we are not going for walks or doing physical activity and using uh, the sugar. So it's not getting directed where it needs to go. And so it has to get restored um, and that requires the insulin and it tends to get restored around our middle. So when we see kind of that weight that's all in the abdomen and the arms and legs are fairly skinny, it's a sure sign that you're doing this yo-yo. And so, uh, so we release a bunch of insulin. The insulin is not, it's not a very precise mechanism. It usually overhits the mark and then we crash. Then our blood sugar is too low because the insulin got rid of um, all of it. And now we're in a state of both um, high insulin, which gives us that, you know, after meal coma feeling, you know, the Thanksgiving turkey fatigue, that's that feeling is, is too much insulin. So it gives us that feeling and we overshoot the mark. So now we're low blood sugar and that requires release of a different hormone, cortisol, your stress hormone to, uh, to get that stored sugar re-released. And so you end up being in this kind of a roller coaster of high and low blood sugar. And not only does it not feel good, it's terrible for your brain and your metabolism. And so what we want to do is really lower that glycemic load. And so the intermittent fasting and just eating a little bit less uh, does that. But there's some other things that we can do too. If we really focus on adding fat or fiber to a meal, that's going to slow down the digestion and slow down this spike in the blood sugar. So another key strategy for us here. So, so this is a little snapshot of what it all might actually look like, right? How, how would this diet come together and, uh, and actually look on your uh, dinner plate? So it looks pretty delicious, right? And everybody hones in on these uh, pizza pictures. This is using cauliflower crust. If you haven't tried that yet, it's readily available. You can get it here in Vaughn's in town or at Trader Joe's. Um, but it adds a nice amount of fiber and then you can put on healthy toppings, right? It doesn't have to be um, an unhealthy uh, pizza. You can use lots of sauce and just a little bit of cheese to hold it together, not tons and tons of cheese. So my 28-day program has um, a great menus and, uh, and recipes and shopping lists, so it's all ready to go for you. Um, there's uh, some great local chefs out here if you're looking for another online program. Um, I like dietdoctor.com pretty well. You can pick um, good uh, programs that way. Um, some people that like the visuals really do well with um, Pinterest, and you can just search for paleo or keto recipes. Um, and there's a really interesting book that was just published um, called Fast This Way by Dave Asprey. He's not a doctor, but he's uh, what the people call one of those biohackers. So he's studied a heck of a lot of stuff, but it's a pretty good book. So. So this is one of my, also one of my favorite brain health foods, dark chocolate. And chocolate really is a good brain food. And I'm talking about the real stuff, the dark stuff, 70% or greater. 
but uh, chocolate contains a ton of really key ingredients. It's a good source of magnesium and glutathione. We're getting some healthy fats in it, um, as long as we're not eating lots of milk chocolate or white chocolate that have the unhealthy fats in it. Um, that dark color, you know, is one of those uh, shorthands for finding foods that are rich in antioxidants because it's highly colored. So dark chocolate definitely counts. And most of the studies on chocolate have uh, have used quite a lot of it in the studies, like, you know, three ounces a day. So that's a, you know, a good sized chocolate bar. So if you're eating like the little squares or the dark Hershey Kisses or, um, you know, those little amounts breaking up your bar into bits and snacking on it throughout the day, you can feel good about that. That's definitely a, a brain healthy um, treat to let yourself indulge in. And here's just a couple more of the th great things that um, that uh, cocoa does for our brain. Um, it really improves the blood flow and, uh, and, and all of the benefits that come along with that. So here's another pathway that we are um, trying to prevent, right? And this is the brain atrophy, right? We don't want our brains shrinking um, because clearly that's going to lead to, uh, to problems with cognition and motion as well. And uh, perhaps you or somebody you know has Parkinson's and that's a big piece of what's happening in this situation. And one of the major things, I started to touch upon this, but we'll circle back to it. One of the major things that uh, leads to that brain atrophy is toxic exposures, um, literally things that are poisoning our brain. Um, and they can come in places that we aren't thinking about. For example, you know, the sushi that we love and think is a nice, healthy, you know, low calorie, low carb treat um, can sometimes be filled with mercury. Um, you see some tests here, just examples um, from some of my patients that had high levels of blood mercury and other metals. So um, when I'm working with clients one on one and we're strategizing on, you know, what we need to change to impact this individual's uh, path um, and protect their brain, um, looking into toxic exposures is certainly a big one. Here are probably our biggest sources of toxic exposure. Um, the plastic, plastic is everywhere, and especially plastic that our food comes in and plastic that goes into the microwave. All of that plastic gets into our food and, um, and those toxins, those BPAs um, have a brain disrupting effect. Toxins also end up in the animals that we eat, and uh, most of the toxins that we're most worried about are fat soluble, so they are most common in the dairy and the meat products that we eat. So if you're not eating um, clean, grass-fed, organic um, meat and dairy products, you are getting a good dose of chemicals and toxins um, in that food. So, so when we talk about toxins, usually the next thing we talk about is detox. And, uh, and that word, you know, it's sometimes scary to people or sometimes they just don't understand it. But it's basically the process of getting these toxins out of our body. And our liver is the main thing that does that. So uh, there's a number of different steps that we have to go through and they're supported by different types of antioxidants. So um, doctors like me really think about these different steps as we're trying to um, specifically target what we're trying to get out of somebody. For example, are we trying to get, you know, some of those plastic residues out of the brain or are we more focused on heavy metals, um, et cetera? So the easiest way to think about toxins is just reducing your exposure, right? So you can work with somebody like me to get out what's already in there, but you can work your, on your own on just not letting any more toxins come in. And so if you have old amalgam fillings, um, those should come out. That's a source of exposure. You should avoid high mercury fish and you can find uh, these nice lists. A couple organizations publish these. This one's for the, from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium also publishes a list and it helps you choose you know, what fish in our local markets are going to be clean and low in mercury and which ones do we need to stay away from. And up here, uh, the worst ones are uh, tuna, uh, ahi and big eye and swordfish. Um, 
orange roughy stuff that you know shows up on the menus right and shows up in the markets so we want to stay away from those we can also eat foods that really support our detox pathways onions garlic anything in that family beets artichokes cilantro chlorella parsley those are all great foods for helping um, detox and uh, sweating is also a great technique and chelation is uh, that process that um, you would work with the doctor with to uh, to pull stuff out intentionally so um, but sweating is is surprisingly um, effective and it's a pleasant way right so whether you're doing saunas or baths or exercising or any way that you're working up a sweat um, you are helping yourself detox the skin is the largest organ in the body so we want to put it to uh, to use and the saying here is the cure for anything is salt water sweat tears or the ocean If we're talking about uh, vitamins and supplements for uh, for detoxification and for targeting the brain specifically, glutathione is probably my favorite one. And your levels can be checked um, on a routine blood test uh, with that um, liver test called GGT. It's run by LabCorp. Anybody, it's like a six dollar test. Um, so that's the first place we. Uh, I look to see if your reserves are adequate enough. And then often, you know, we give people lots of glutathione to both jumpstart these detox pathways and to provide key um, antioxidants for the brain. Green tea is a great source of antioxidants for the brain. So enjoy your green tea. I have mine right here. Um, we want those good fats going into the brain and the most important fats for the brain are choline and phosphatidylserine and some ones that we've just kind of newly named called plasmalogens and the omega-3s of course so choline and serine are coming from um, eggs uh, lecithin is a common source as well but it's in the yolk so if you think you're doing uh, yourself a health favor by eating just the egg whites you're missing out on all of the nutrition in the yolks so get some uh, organic eggs or get your eggs from the farmers market and uh, enjoy that whole egg and know you're doing something good for your brain so let's talk about a different topic that's important for our brain sleep yeah, don't we all wish we were sleeping that soundly? Uh, sleep is, we, we seem to lose the ability to sleep really well as we get older, uh, which is unfortunate because sleep um, plays a huge role in cognition and you have to get the right amount of sleep. Too much sleep or too little sleep are both risk factors. So this research study found uh, peak performance in people who slept 7.6 hours, but that's just an average, right? You're going to need to know what you, um, you need for yourself. And if you're not getting quality sleep, for example, if you have sleep apnea or restless legs or um, a partner that disturbs your sleep or an animal that disturbs your sleep all night, um, those are problems when you're not getting into that deep restorative sleep. Uh, your brain isn't doing the key things that it needs to do. And so here's a picture of kind of where we go uh, when we fall asleep. We go through these different stages of sleep. Um, up here in REM is generally where we're dreaming. Um, but down here in deep sleep is really important because this is where uh, we're the many important detox things are happening, right? That's when our glymphatic system, that drainage system I mentioned, that's when that's most active and it's clearing things out. Um, during deep sleep is when we release growth hormone, uh, which is key for uh, repair and regeneration. So sleep is super important here. Breathing is also super important and you wouldn't think that this would be a problem, but a lot of people just don't know how to breathe very well. You know, either it's because of a lifetime of anxiety or a lack of exercise or sitting in chairs with bad posture. A lot of people just breathe um, with the very top of their chest. Uh, they're not doing diaphragmatic breathing or using their whole lungs and it leads to a whole host of issues. But uh, so breathing is one of the things that I wanted um, to make sure that we represented and taught people about in the app. So there is a 
series of um, breathing meditations that really teach you how to breathe properly uh, when you go through this 28 day program. You can do a little self assessment on, uh, on your own oxygen level. I'll tell you how to do it now and then you can try it. Um, you can try it now, I suppose. Um, but what we really want to see is how quickly your body uh, responds with that, that impulse to breathe in. So what we're doing is we're emptying our lungs as much as possible with a really big exhale holding our, our nose and keeping that exhale out until you get that little gasp or you know you feel your muscles kind of tightening to uh, to force you to breathe again and if that takes less than 20 seconds you need to work on your uh, your um, your breathing and if you can hold that exhale for more than 40 seconds you're in a great um, position and what this is really measuring is your sensitivity to carbon dioxide um, and it can be impacted by a lot of things but this is something that can be learned and practiced and the research shows us that um, you know when we are in that excellent stage as opposed to um, poor breathers there's a 61 percent improvement in uh, in cognition just from breathing so um, yeah so this app is a uh, I'm pretty excited about it people are uh, we're just rolling it out so but the you know first couple dozen people who've been through it are really loving it um, it's easy to use it's on your phone it gives you reminders gives you everything you need um, I put together a supplement bundle of the key things that are most important for your brain um, that you can purchase along with it and uh, it really helps you uh, put all of this stuff into practice so it's a sort of a great um, you know prelude to for example coming to work with me you know see what you can do on your own for 28 days in terms of uh, implementing some of these lifestyle things and uh, and just see how how great you feel it's a pretty um, easy thing so I'm gonna be doing a webinar in a couple weeks talking about this specifically um, it's on Wednesday April 13th um, maybe Nancy can send around um, or I guess you guys can probably find it here uh, you can sign up for that find the link on my website um, to sign up for it um, or send us a note um, through my website and we'll make sure you're signed up for that upcoming webinar um, or if you sign up um, for my mailing list on my website um, not only will you get announcements like that but you'll get announcements um, when I put new blog posts up or when we're doing other um, specials or events or seminars or things like that as well uh, so with that I'm going to check the time looks like we're just about perfect and uh, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and switch it over and I would be happy to uh, entertain some questions from you all. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Oberg. That was that was great. We can't wait to learn more about the program and join in on the webinar. I will go ahead and send that information out to all those who signed up for today's presentation. And we'll also have this uh, presentation. It's being recorded, so it will be on our website in about seven days. So just check back there. And if you have any um, any you want to review the, the video, please feel free. So um, I don't have any questions right now at the moment. If anybody um, has a question, please feel free. I know, Ruth, you have your hand up. Ruth Bergstrom, if you can type out your question, that would be great. Um, one question is, Dr. Oberg, um, I am I am a cardiac amyloid patient. Is that amyloid the same as which can affect the brain? Hmm. Uh, they are cousins. It's a little there. It's a complex question about where those amyloid uh, proteins deposit. So just because they are um, in the heart doesn't necessarily mean they're in the brain or vice versa. There's an autoimmune component of those conditions as well. So um, that's a pretty complicated one. But if you're, you know, if you are noticing any brain uh, health changes and concerns. Um, then you should definitely ask your primary or your cardiologist for a referral to um, like a neuro, a neuro psych person would probably be the best one to um, get a thorough testing and evaluation. Thank you. Um, other question is, do you have information on lion's mane mushrooms? Oh, that's a good one. You know, lion's mane mushrooms are available here in the La Jolla farmer's market now. 
that's it's so fun i bought some the other day and uh i the way i cooked them up was um like a crab cake um you know you just kind of like put your spices on it and put it in the pan and um, it tasted kind of like a crab cake it was pretty tasty um, but the research on on lion's mane for brain health is pretty it's pretty good um it's in the that supplement bundle that i put together one of the nutrients in there is lion's mane um, but I think it's relatively safe for everybody. Um, it's certainly not a, a cheap supplement, um, but I th the research backing lion's mane for brain health is, is pretty solid. Thank you. Um, Pamela asks, I have heard that taking metformin is a healthy supplement to help your insulin as we age. Can you please talk about this? Yeah, so metformin is a prescription medication um, that is routinely prescribed to people with diabetes or high blood sugar, um, but it's increasingly used um, by non-diabetics for anti-aging. Um, so you don't definitely, I mean, it's a prescription, so you have to talk to your doctor about it, but it does have some of those same mechanisms of activating that CERT pathway of making your metabolism a little bit more thrifty. So I personally am a big fan of metformin. Um, but again, it's a, it's a question that you'd want to uh, bring to your doctor because it does have to be prescribed by a doctor. Um, but I'm a big fan. I think it has a lot of, uh, lot of use and indications and it's relatively safe. Um, and it definitely is great for people with diabetes or, um, that hypo hyperglycemia picture. Great. Um, Dr. Ober, what is the cost of basic brain health assessment and does your insurance cover um, any or majority of testing? Um, I don't work with insurance personally. Um, with any doctor that doesn't do insurance, you can always send your, uh, your super bills for me on and see if you get reimbursement. You never know. Each insurance company is totally different in that. Um, Appointments with me, new new patient appointments with me are uh, 375 and if we're doing any of those in-office cognitive tests, they are included. Um, if you go for a full neuropsych evaluation at UCSD, um, if it is indicated and you can get in, um, it would be covered by insurance. Um, I tried to get a patient in there. Uh, a couple months ago and her first available, the first available appointment was like six months out for her. Um, so it's not the easiest thing to set up, um, but there's a lot of options out there. Thank you. Another question is, can the 28 day program help post stroke people, especially during the first six months after the stroke? Can the motor or sensory skills be, be improved with the 28 day program as well as the mental skills? Yeah, well, I mean, without knowing anybody's individual answers, obviously I can't um, predict or, uh, or guarantee what anybody's results are going to be. But these lifestyle strategies are great for anybody and somebody following a stroke should definitely be following a brain healthy diet and practicing these breathing techniques and doing the exercise tips and tracking and fasting and doing all of those good things that I've been talking about. So, um, and that app does walk people through those. Great, thank you. That was the last question for me, unless one comes in. Um, and I think that's all. So thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Oberg, for this wonderful presentation. Again, we will share all the information for Dr. Oberg's upcoming webinar and this recording as well. And please visit our website again for more information about our programs and our upcoming events. That's ljcommunitycenter.org. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Oberg. Thanks, Nancy. Take care, everybody.